If you're watching this video, there's a serious chance you've also seen one or more videos from the series Evolution Simulated, where we just watch ecosystems evolve on their own. In that series there are two continents, but no way for plants that evolved here to spread here. I'm not sure if you could tell, but this annoys me to no end. I mean, the plants in the west and the east are completely unrelated trees of life. There's no interaction. I need to fix this. And there are, of course, two solutions. Seeds that float and seeds that are moved by animals. There will be several ways to target a specific group of animals, all of them inspired by how that works on Earth. But, as you might have noticed, I like to put a science fiction, speculative evolution spin on things sometimes. Therefore, as part of the new update, some flying animals might even grab their fruit right out of the air. So, for those of you new here, this is evolution simulation game The Sapling, my solo indie game project. It's a game where you can basically do two types of things. On the one hand, there are a number of scenarios tasking you to design an ecosystem that meets specific requirements. On the other, there is a sandbox where you can build your own algae, plants and animals, turn on random mutations and see how they evolve. First of all, you might wonder, how about all the seeds that spread by wind, like we discussed last week? The answer to that is, yeah, a good point, that might actually work. But from my experience playing with the simulation, most of the times it doesn't. The wind just moves the seeds to a random place, and in the case of an island, this most of the times means the ocean. On small islands in particular, such a large part of the offspring is lost, that typically plants with seed dispersal by wind go extinct quickly. Way more effective are seeds that float in water. So how does it work exactly? When a seed drops into the water here, where will it end up? The purest solution might be to just move it a little bit every day until it touches land again. But as you can imagine, moving 10,000 coconuts every second will take more computation time than we can afford, in particular because the game already has performance problems in some situations. Instead, I will use an optimization technique I already use in various other places in the game, which is to give each location in the game its own calendar. When a new seed of plant X is dropped into the ocean, we immediately calculate where it will end up by moving it in random directions until it reaches land again. Let's say this is location 1 tree. We also know how long this journey has taken, let's say 2 days, so we take the calendar of location 1 tree, find the date that is 2 days from now and put there new plant X grows. The big optimization here is that we can do all of this in one go, and in the meantime the simulation can forget about this seed. Still, after implementing this, the profiler showed that the simulation was losing a lot of time figuring out where all the seeds would end up, so I've optimized that even further by making a list of all coast positions right after the creation of a new planet, and for all of them pre-calculate three other random coast positions reachable from here. So when a floating seed is dropped, instead of calculating its journey on the fly, it just has to pick one of three pre-calculated destinations from that starting point. And this works surprisingly well. For example, if I add a plant with floating seeds here and speed up time, it doesn't take long before you see it pop up on other islands. We nearly always see them pop up on the side of the island that faces the motherland, which I didn't add explicitly, but is of course what you would expect, proving that the system works as intended. But of course, this only works if plants live near the water. For all other species, we also still have that other method of spreading seeds. Animals. Animals in the simulation can now carry seeds with them, either in their fur, if they have fur, or in their stomach. The seed types that get stuck in fur are relatively straightforward. Just give a plant these seeds, and if there are furry animals in the area that cover long distances in their lifetime, you will discover this plant growing in places that it couldn't have reached otherwise. The same is true for this seed, which, unlike most other seed types, survives being eaten. 
there is no concept of defecation in the simulation. So in the sapling this plant will grow wherever this animal dies, which seems to work just as well. In a way this makes this seed take the opposite strategy of the nut, which tries to avoid being eaten. The edible seed strategy becomes a lot less effective however if all plant species in the area use it and the number of animals that eat seeds is limited. And that's where fruit comes in. Fruits are extra interesting to animals because they provide more energy than other seed types and to advertise this to animals, fruits come with an extra separate color slider. Of course this will require more instincts from the animals, so the instinct system also got an overhaul. Simulation wise this was a small change, but for the UI it was a massive project, because I decided to throw out the previous Instinct Editor UI completely. This UI has already undergone many iterations since I added it, and all of these iterations had one thing in common. I did not like them. The one you are looking at right now is the first one I am more or less happy with. The main tricks that make it work, at least for me personally, is to not use the plain animal editor background color, but instead a beautiful gradient, and the insight that an instinct can be much more compact. Similar to how I realized that the season summary I used in the world UI could also be used in the season editor, I realized that the instinct summary with a few small tweaks could be used in the instinct editor. But the changes were not just visual. I've also made changes to how instincts work simulation-wise. Before, animals were attracted to one very specific color, and nothing else, and one particular pitch, and nothing else. This kind of worked for manually defined instincts, but if you turned on random mutations, animals could suddenly develop a very specific interest in, for example, red things, or yellow things, out of thin air. The result of this was that it took very long for a useful instinct to evolve, and it was usually limited to, if you see green, go towards it, or whatever the plant color was. Now, instead, animals can be interested in a whole range of colors, and random mutations only change the upper and lower boundaries of this range. A range might get wider over time, if it's beneficial to be interested in more colors, or smaller, if it's beneficial to make a distinction between two colors. Or perhaps a prey population is slowly changing in color and predator instincts adjust their boundaries to evolve along with them. This new range mechanic also provided a nice opportunity to make the color seeing limitations of eyes more realistic. Before, each eye had specific colors it could and could not see. If a creature could not see the color purple, all purple life forms are practically invisible. This is of course not how it works. Humans cannot see the color ultraviolet, for example, so we can't see the ultraviolet colors that many flowers use to attract bees and butterflies, but we can still see the flower. From the next update onwards, each eye will be different in how small the instinct ranges can get for various colors. For primitive eyes, for example, the instinct cannot get more specific than this, while this eye can get hyper-specific in the ultraviolet range. Okay, so the plant species and the animal species can develop a pretty intimate relationship, and that relationship will be beneficial for the animal for sure. But what if the animal is not moving to other places? In some situations, plants that are picky about which animals they target might have better chances of survival. To make this possible, I'm adding a simple poison system with three poison types. Fruits can evolve to become more and more poisonous with one of these three poison types, and animals can evolve to become more and more poison resistant to at maximum two poison types simultaneously. Let's make concrete what will happen here. Imagine a plant species with fruits, but nearly all of its fruits are eaten by slow moving animals. There are also flying animals around, but on the brink of extinction. And now imagine that one plant by accident changes its poison type to something only the flying animals are resistant to. The slow animals will quickly learn to avoid this fruit and eat something else instead, creating a whole new source of fruits that the flying species have to themselves completely. This in turn means that flying animals will survive and reproduce and every single one of them will carry the seeds they have eaten all over the planet allowing the plant to conquer completely new land masses and become the most successful plant this planet has ever seen. From the perspective of the slow animals, on the other hand, 
one of their food sources has all of a sudden become poisonous to them, perhaps even to the extent that one bite kills them. Learning to avoid these fruits has suddenly become a highly advantageous adaptation, but how exactly will they learn this? And that is the last thing we need to make poison work, a diet system for animals. Food types as a whole can be turned on and off here, but for some food types you can be more specific and fruit is one of them. I've given plants four communication channels to communicate to animals who they are and the first one is the color slider we mentioned before. Number two and three are new red handles that make the fruit longer and curved and finally these new diamonds control the size of each fruit segment. And all of this can be specified in a diet, for example a diet that avoids purple bananas or an animal that eats red melon-like fruits. So having fruits that are toxic might be an effective way to attract flying species and cross the ocean. But of course there's also a much simpler solution. Just have your fruits really high up. And this in turn brought me to a feature that I have wanted to add ever since the fight and flight update where various players correctly pointed out that the predator birds so far are highly inefficient because they first need to land before they can start catching and eating their prey. What if birds can eat some food types right from the sky? Inspired by various speculative evolution alien plants, I decided I wanted a gas bag floating fruit thing. Modeling it took way longer than expected because whatever I tried, it never looked like the fruit was floating on its own. At last I figured out that the branch should hang loose. Visualizing eating from the air was another challenge because it meant I had to revise my elegant little flight animation system. It works as follows. Say the visualization system receives a message from the simulation that animal X is flying somewhere. That animal is already looping another animation, so I will put it on the schedule for when the animation is finished. Once the time is there, the animal will move to its new location while the wing flapping animation is being looped, until it reaches its goal. But what if we know that during this flight, this animal catches another animal, or grabs an egg? or a gas fruit. I was already implementing an ugly extension which involved an animation that had to be timed exactly right when I realized there's a much more elegant solution. What if stooping is considered a separate action? Under the hood it shares a lot of code with flying but ultimately it is its own thing which can be planned separately. So whenever the visualization receives a new flight with a stoop down in the middle it's split up into two animations that are played sequentially. An extra advantage is that I could easily make the stoop action look a bit different with a higher speed and a different pose. Also, it's super cool to have my own name in the code now everywhere. So it took floating seeds, seeds in fur, an instinct overhaul, a poison system, a fruit editor, a diet system and the possibility to eat during flight. But finally, we no longer have to watch the horror of plants evolving separately on each individual island.